Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Nick Miles, and in the early hours of Sunday the 10th of December, these are our main stories. The United Nations has warned that 9 out of 10 people in Gaza can't eat every day and that half the population is starving. Rwanda has criticised the President of the Democratic Republic of Congo for comparing his Rwandan counterpart to Adolf Hitler. Iran has prevented the family of Mahsa Amani, whose death in custody led to mass protests from collecting a major human rights award in France. Also in this podcast, we learn why a close cousin of T-Rex was a fussy eater. It didn't eat the rest of the carcasses of these two prey items. Only the hind legs were eaten. Almost every day now, we've been reporting on the impact of the war in Gaza on the people there. Nine weeks after the conflict began, the BBC has spoken to a senior member of the UN who's seen the situation on the ground. He's Carl Scow, a deputy director of the World Food Programme. He's been in Rafa, a city in the south of the Strip, and he's been painting a bleak picture of what he found. I met people who had not eaten for days. The survey that we managed to do during the humanitarian pause shows that half the population is starving. People are not getting enough to eat. They're not eating at all, or they're eating once a day. And they don't know, they don't know where the next meal is going to come from. Uh, you know, there is no food whatsoever in the shops. We went to a few supermarkets. They're completely empty of food. There is some shampoo, maybe, but that's it. We have only been able to get some 10 percent of the food needed in Gaza in since the start of the war. So the situation is uh, increasingly desperate, and you can feel it when you are at the distribution sites where we distribute food and and flour. People are angry. People are uh, frustrated and they are desperate. Let's hear now from two people living in Gaza. First, a man in the north of the Strip. We were displaced from an area in the north. We are staying in tents made out of nylon. We don't have any blankets for me and my wife and children to cover ourselves with. Regarding food, there is no food and no one brings food. And the prices here are very high. One can only have one meal a day and God knows if there are people who go on with their day with no meal at all. This woman said she'd been displaced by the fighting 11 times. We don't eat anything but plain bread and we tell each other to eat only a quarter of the bread so the bag doesn't finish and look for more bread. Kids tell us we want food, we want food, so we give it to them. We, the adults, can manage. Well, according to new figures from the Hamas-run health authority, 17,700 people died in Gaza since the conflict began. Israel insists its military response to the bloody assault by Hamas on the 7th of October is proportionate to the threat. Israeli media reports say at least 420 Israeli soldiers have been killed since the start of the war. Our correspondent Paul Adams sent this report from Jerusalem. The scenes inside the NASA hospital in Khan Yunis are hard to watch. Patients, men and children are being treated on the floor. It's desperately crowded. The children look stunned. The hospital is overwhelmed. The doctors in despair. Ahmed Mugrabi is head of plastic surgery and the Burns unit. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm helpless today. Actually, all families came to me, please operate on my son, operate on my brother. So I couldn't help them because I don't have anesthesia doctors. I, ca- I can't open the operative room without anesthesia drugs. So I don't know how to help my people. In the Jabalia refugee camp in the north, where street battles are still raging, fresh graves are prepared in the sandy soil of an alleyway between two shuttered shops. The camp is surrounded. No aid is getting in. Israel calls this a Hamas stronghold, one of several it's trying to control. Colonel Richard Hecht is a spokesman for the army. This is a long war. This is a complicated war. Uh, As we speak, there's uh, special forces working in the south, in a very, very complex battlefield, and also in the north, in Sajaya and Jabalia, taking care of this infrastructure that Hamas have been building for years. 
How much longer will this long, complicated war last? Israel knows the clock is ticking. Their American allies may have vetoed a ceasefire resolution at the UN, but the Biden administration is beginning to sound impatient. Like Israel, Washington does not want Hamas to survive as a military force when this is over. But it does want the Gaza Strip to survive as a place to live. And right now, it's teetering on the edge of total collapse. The World Food Programme says half the population is facing starvation. And the charity Save the Children says thousands under the age of five are so malnourished they need urgent medical treatment to avoid death. Paul Adams reporting. After that veto of the UN resolution by the US on Friday, the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has accused Washington of being complicit in war crimes. He said he now held the US responsible for the bloodshed of Palestinian children, women and the elderly in Israel's attacks on Gaza. The family of Masa Amini, the Iranian Kurdish woman whose death in custody last year led to nationwide protests in Iran, have been banned from travelling to France to collect a top human rights prize in her honour. Our Middle East regional editor Mike Thompson reports. The Iranian authorities have long had a problem with Masa Amini's family, who've insisted she was killed when in custody, despite official claims that she died of an undisclosed medical condition. So when Miss Amini's parents and brother prepared to board their flight to France at Tehran Airport, they were stopped and their passports confiscated. They were to be presented with the European Union's Sakharov Prize, awarded posthumously to Masa Amini for freedom of thought and her role in triggering the woman life. Freedom Movement. The prize, set up to honour the promotion of human rights and freedoms, will be awarded in Strasbourg. Mike Thompson. Ukraine's First Lady, Olena Zelenska, has warned that Ukrainians will be left to die without more support from Western countries. Speaking to the BBC from Kyiv, hours after a Russian missile attack, Olena Zelenska said her country could be in mortal danger because of funding delays. She said it hurt to see help fading. The First Lady was talking to our correspondent, Laura Koonsberg. Nearly two years since the war began and her family's life was turned upside down, Olena Zelenska's concerns were simple and stark. We really need the help, she told me. We cannot get tired of this situation. If we do, we die. But if the world gets tired, they will simply let us die, she said. Fears seem to arise here in Ukraine that the West's early fervour for its cause is fading just when it's needed the most. Laura Koonsberg. The last meal of a 75 million year old tyrannosaur has been revealed by scientists. The hind legs of two baby dinosaurs. Well, scientists at the Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada, say the preservation of the animal and of the small unfortunate creatures inside it shines new light on how these giant predators lived and ate. Our science correspondent, Victoria Gill, reports. This young Gorgosaurus, a large tyrannosaur and a close cousin of T. rex, has been preserved for 75 million years with its last meal fossilised in its gut. Experts at Canada's Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology, where the fossil's been studied, noticed small toe bones poking through its ribs. Closer examination and more careful preparation revealed that these were actually two sets of hind legs belonging to two baby bird-like dinosaurs called Chittipas. One of the lead researchers, Dr. Darla Zelenitsky, says this is a unique insight into how juvenile tyrannosaurs would have hunted. I think what was really interesting about this teenage Gorgosaurus, if any of us have teenagers out there, it seems to be a very particular eater. It didn't eat the rest of the carcasses of these two prey items. Only the hind legs were eaten. So this teenage um, Gorgosaurus seems to have had an appetite for drumsticks of this chitty pass. The scientists say the fossil is a glimpse of how dramatically tyrannosaurs changed as they grew, from slender, agile hunters that chased small prey and bit through them, to the burly, powerful animals whose jaws were able to crush the bones of larger dinosaurs. Victoria Gill. Still to come, the calm, composed reporter on the world of high-priced movie merchandise. I'm never going to get this close to a rocket firing Boba Fett again in my life. You can hold it if you want. Oh, come on. You're kidding me. Oh, my. Wow. May the force be with him. (laughs) 
the Global News Podcast brings you the world's latest breaking news and developments. But some stories need a little more time. I'm Katia Adler, host of the brand new BBC World Service podcast, The Global Story. Every weekday, The Global Story peels back the layers on one major news story with insights from the BBC's worldwide network of experts. So find out all the latest news right here on The Global News Podcast and then dive into one big story with me on The Global Story. Search for The Global Story wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Welcome back to The Global News Podcast. For years, Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo have been vying for control and influence in the eastern part of the DRC. Well, now Rwanda has criticised the DRC for comparing the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, to Adolf Hitler and accusing him of having expansionist aims. Our Africa regional editor, Will Ross, told me how Rwanda has responded. A Rwandan government spokesperson has described this as what she called a clear and loud threat by the Congolese president. And she then went on to talk about some of the context, the problems going on in eastern Congo at the moment. And she referred to Hutu rebels, who she said were more armed than ever. And she also talked about ethnic cleansing of Congolese Tutsis inside eastern Congo. And what this shows is that they're keen to to reply to this uh, allegation from Felix Chesakedi that the Rwandan government, or, and Paul Kagame in particular, is expansionist. And that's why he made this comparison to Adolf Hitler, because for years the Congolese president has accused the Rwandan military of intervening militarily inside eastern Congo. And of course, Rwanda has played a role in in wars that have seen governments change in Congo. So there is history there. And at the moment, there's this dreadful conflict going on in eastern Congo involving the M23 rebel group, which many reports have shown Rwanda is backing, even though Kigali denies that. Will Ross. It is 75 years since the world united around a groundbreaking document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Born out of the horrors of the Second World War, the Declaration aspired to ensure that all human beings were born free and equal in dignity, regardless of their nationality, ethnicity, religion or anything else. So how is that aim working out 75 years on? Our Geneva correspondent Imogen Folks has been talking to some of those who've led the United Nations human rights work over the years. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights... Momentous opening words of a great charter for world peace. It was the world's never again moment. A charter agreed by 192 countries guaranteeing fundamental freedoms to all. The right to life, to freedom of expression the right not to be tortured. You came from another planet and just looked at the human rights framework, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all the the treaties, the conventions. You think you've arrived in heaven. Why is it not the case? (laughs) Representing almost 2,000 million people, they came with hope, born of common struggle. Louise Arbour, UN Human Rights Chief from 2004 until 2008, knows the promises made in 1948 are often not kept. Volker Turk, currently in the job, agrees. I am very much concerned that we lose the essence of what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was and was meant to be in response to cataclysmic events during the Second World War. I hereby declare open the 35th meeting of the Human Rights Council. 75 years on, UN Human Rights sits atop a vast array of committees and experts. Their job to scrutinise countries on their records, on poverty, housing, the right to food, the rights of women. There are whole teams looking at crisis regions. They gather evidence, often of horrific violations, including war crimes. But, reminds Louise Arbour, they can't prosecute only publish. I think that's part of the dilemma. How do you use your voice? I think to be the megaphone for the denunciation of injustices at some point becomes counterproductive. It just illuminates how impotent the system is. It's like you scream in the wilderness. 
Russia bombed it. A war crime, UN investigators say. Commissioned by the UN, it says the UK government's welfare policies have had tragic consequences. But even if it is just screaming no country, whether it's Russia over war crimes in Ukraine or the United Kingdom over child poverty, wants a negative report from the UN. Zaid Rad Al Hussein, human rights chief until 2018, believes the UN shouldn't flinch from disapproval even from the most powerful. I knew from my experience in the former Yugoslavia that if the UN believed that it's in the friends business, it produces catastrophic results. The UN is not there to become friendly with the member states. Would you allow US interrogators to waterboard terrorist prisoners? Absolutely. Watch your works, okay, folks? Believe me, it works, okay? And so when Donald Trump on the campaign trail in 2016 argued in favor of torture, Zaid didn't hesitate. Someone asked me about Donald Trump, and I said, yes, I think he's dangerous. I mean, how could you not think that? Non-stop flood of migrants stretching resources to the map. The numbers using small boats to cross the narrow but deadly stretch of water between France and England. And less developed countries, sometimes struggling with conflict, can be irritated by what they see as double standards from the wealthy West. But Louise Arbour think they have a point. The West were always in a position of asking others to do something that was hard for them to do. But when it came a time where the West was asked to do something that was hard for it to do, it choked. And I think the post 9-11 world showed how the U.S. was very quick to even reconsider fundamental norms like the absolute prohibition on torture. And now if we look at the entire migration agenda, when Europe and America are asked to do something that's hard for them to do this time, they're nowhere to be seen. So is there anything to celebrate on this 75th anniversary? It's easy to dismiss the UN as an ineffective and yet interfering nuisance, but its human rights standards only exist because 75 years ago, the same member states who criticise them now were determined to make things better for all of us. That report by Imogen Folks in Geneva. EU officials have reached a deal on the world's first comprehensive laws to regulate artificial intelligence. Britain, the United States and China are working on similar proposals. Tom Dewsbury reports. After 36 hours of talks in Brussels, an agreement was reached on how Europe should respond to the use of AI. The discussions focused on areas such as the police's use of facial recognition and generative AI, like the chatbot ChatGPT. The proposals include safeguards on the use of artificial intelligence within the EU, which become more stringent based on how big of an impact the tech could have. Fines could be imposed on companies for failing to follow the rules. To become law, it needs to pass a vote in the EU's parliament early next year. If it does, the guidelines could be enforced as early as 2025. Tom Dewsbury. When Star Wars first came to cinema screens in the late 1970s, it not only ushered in the era of the space blockbuster, but was also the start of a whole merchandise industry. More than 40 years on, the original toys have become highly sought after. Some are even fetching a few hundred thousand dollars. BBC business reporter and Star Wars superfan Rowan Bridge has been to one of the biggest toy fairs dedicated to that film franchise. Welcome to Echo Base Live, the largest vintage Star Wars toy fair in the UK, where people like me come to buy back our childhood memories. For a summer, me and my friends were just on Tatooine with all of our little Jawas and, you know, running down a hill with my Millennium Falcon, you know, it was just an amazing, idyllic childhood. It takes me back to simpler times. Me and my brother loved it. It was the only thing we really connected with. In 1977, when Star Wars burst onto the big screen, it helped launch the modern era of movie merchandising. Kenner's new Star Wars Death Star Space Station. Action figures each sold separately. Those figures and play sets that once sold for a few dollars can now go for prices that seem out of this world. And the rarer the piece, the greater the value. At the centre of the toy fair, in a protective case and specially lit, is the holy grail of Star Wars collecting, a prototype Boba Fett figure. The first voice you're about to hear is my colleague Steve, asking why I'm taking a picture of it. I'm taking a photo of Boba Fett. What? I get to see this thing once in a lifetime. It's the only chance I'm ever going to... I'm never going to get this close to a rocket firing Boba Fett again in my life. 
Oh, we'll get it out. You can hold it if you want. Oh, come you're on. kidding me. Yeah, no, get it out. Oh, my. Yeah. Wow. As you might have gathered, I was rather excited. The figure itself is owned by collector Martin Schofield. There's probably 120 of these in the world. They didn't release to the public because there was a choking hazard. We'd estimate that's anywhere between 100 and 150,000 pounds. For a piece of plastic? For a little bit of plastic, yeah. To understand how we ended up here, take a trip with me back to the 1970s. When Star Wars came out, movie merchandising existed, but nothing like the scale of today. In what turned out to be a lucrative move, the film's director, George Lucas, took a lower fee for the film in order to hold on to the merch rights, effectively the right to put Star Wars on everything from cereal packets to plastic toys. Tim Effler was part of the team at the toy makers Kenner that worked on Star Wars. There are so many of the elements that made it natural for a toy line. You had these fantastic vehicles, you had villains and heroes that were easy to execute and present in toy form, and I think that really got us excited about it. And the story was really straightforward and easy to follow for the most part. It was, it was really designed for kids almost, you know? Now those kids like me, who first played with the toys in the 70s and 80s, are grown men and women. Men and women who were old enough to have the cash to buy back the figures they once played with and discarded. The older you get, you know, you've paid off your mortgage, your kids have moved out, you've got excess money. Nick Dykes is a Star Wars specialist at the UK auction house, Vectis. And demand drives up the prices, so if you've got a few people that are all looking for the same thing, if you've got that thing... No, you can charge what you want, really, within reason. Being a Mandalorian is not just learning about how to fight. The value of Star Wars and its merchandising hasn't been lost on Disney, who now own the franchise. They've been busy producing new films and TV projects, like this trailer for the Disney Plus series, The Mandalorian. This is the way. These shows are introducing the next generation of fans to the Star Wars universe, the potential vintage collectors of the future. Rowan Bridge, who continues to report while searching for dark forces in distant galaxies. And that is all from us for now, but there will be a new edition of the Global News Podcast later on. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Global News Pod. This edition was mixed by Nick Randall. The producer was Liam McSheffrey. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Nick Mars, and until next time, goodbye. 